the fact that we realize that we can't stop this uh, Russian war machine uh, because it's, it's so much, it's, it's so big, it's so, it's, it's so many troops. So we decided to fight on the economic and the digital front because we believe that uh, if we stop uh, taxpayers paying uh, money to government, which, which they spend not to develop their infrastructure, not to build schools, not to build hospitals, not to build roads, but they use this money to invade their neighbors, to threat uh, all the European countries in the, in, in the world. So we have to stop money flows to Russia. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Kat Zakreski, a tech policy reporter here at the Washington Post. And my guest today is Alex Bornyakov, Deputy Minister of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, who joins us today to discuss his efforts to isolate Russia economically and digitally. Alex, welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. And, rem and remember, we always want to hear from you, our audience. You can share your thoughts and questions for guests on Washington Post Live by tweeting at Post Live. Um, we have a lot to cover today, but first, Alex, can you tell us where you're calling from? Well, I'm in Ukraine, in the western part, but um, unfortunately, I can't disclose my exact location for the safety reasons. Of course. And can you tell me a little bit more about how you're staying online right now? How are you keeping an internet connection with everything going on? Well, well, the first of all, you all should be aware of the fact that Ukraine is is a big country. And if you look on the map on of invasion, you can see that from the eastern part, they advanced uh, maybe like 15 percent of Ukrainian territory there. There were a lot, a lot of troops near the Kiev, so this, it was really difficult. It was a really difficult time. But now they uh, flee flat and uh, uh, Kiev is, is breathing. So um, the self reception in Ukraine is generally OK. There might be some problems in in, in some areas around Kiev. Um, in the western part, it's, it's totally okay. Um, what do we experience from the internet traffic standpoint that maybe it's just a little bit slower than it was usual before the war. But in, in general, like everything is working. Of course, uh, whereas there is war zone, there is no coverage and, and, uh, and the cell reception is bad and sometimes it's just absent. But uh, generally, we just have all... Um, almost a similar uh, level of uh, connectivity as before. I see. And I know when I talked to your colleague, Minister Fedorov, he was speaking with me on a Starlink connection. Have you personally been using the Starlink satellites as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, for the, for, uh, during the first day uh, when we were moving, there was really bad internet. And, and uh, as I mentioned before, the first day it was... Uh, it was messy and it was hectic, so we were moving. And and uh, once we received the first satellite, we set it up, and uh, the speed is really great, and, and the connection uh, is good. Now uh, I know the lot of thousands of Starlinks in, in Ukraine been using for different purposes, even in the war zone. Uh, but my personal experience that the service is great. And can you tell me a little bit more about how Ukraine has been using these Starlinks? Um, I read that hundreds have been deployed to keep hospitals online. What are some of the other ways these satellites are being used? Uh, well, at first we were supplying them to, your, to the, the places where the situation is really difficult, like Chernigiv, uh, like Kharkiv, uh, eastern part of Ukraine, even Mariupol. So. Uh, so there was uh, th there was need from from for military first and hospitals, uh, but then we started to give them out to some enterprises because we need business running. We need companies to work even in cities where it's in close proximity from uh, from Russian troops, and uh, we we know where the situation is difficult and that and there we focus our efforts. So right now. It's more than 10,000 units in Ukraine. So we able to spread them uh, equally and fulfill not just basic needs, but also to to those who are 
as I mentioned before, con want to conduct business and it's, this business is uh, international or it requires instant communication. And I wanted to ask you a little bit more about how it's how those devices are being used, particularly in conflict. There was some concern initially that having these satellites could potentially create new safety risks that people would be able to see where the satellites are and that would give away the location of troops or civilians. What steps are you taking to mitigate those safety risks? Well, first of all, they're really small and it's it's really hard to identify them. Second, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I can't be 100% sure, but I don't think Russians are able to trace them um, because they haven't been aware of this technology and I think their, their equipment not adjusted to trace Starlinks. Um, maybe something is going to change uh, because it's war and everything is changing rapidly, but um, I, I know that there was no cases and there was no evidence when there was uh, some uh, situation where uh, using Starling was, was a threat for someone in, near a battlefield. And uh, the, the variety of options uh, on, on how they're using Starlink is broad. Starlink is broad. Um, surveillance, uh, even our like uh, soldiers uh, on the mission, they they if they uh, spot some uh, I don't know activities on the battlefield, they they using Starlinks to get the surveillance back, this data get back because there is no other option. Uh, communication is not working, and they're happy about it. Really and are you taking any precautions to uh, secure these Starlinks? Um, any extra steps to ensure that, for instance, they're not subject to Russian cyber attacks? Well, first of all, all serial numbers of all devices that we give give out are they uh, they noted, and if if there's if, if there's no uh, connection from people who receive them and they're using them in difficult circumstances uh, and we haven't gotten any confirmation that th this device uh, is in or in our hands we just block them on our side so uh, even uh, if it uh, for some reason was lost or uh, someone just left it and it's in the possession of russian troops it's it's being blocked so they can't use it so it's just a piece of metal for them I see. And I want to shift gears now to the digital blockade. Um, your office has been erecting this digital blockade to isolate Russia, both digitally and economically. Can you tell me a little bit about where that idea originally came from? Well, this idea belongs to Mikhail Fedorov uh, because it, when it's all started, we wanted to, uh, well, we were actually really shocked about this and uh, I wouldn't say I was prepared for that uh, neither my colleagues or friends uh, well we were expecting some uh, movement and maybe there the, the, the might be we, we thought we thought that it might be some actions on the eastern part but we didn't expect this would be so massive um, and uh, when we realized that they not going just to fight for or just help their this rebels on east but they want to destroy completely destroy our country this is where this idea came up because we realized that we fight for not just for you know life of our soldiers but we fight for for our nation for our existence of the nation of ukraine so we realized that this machine this war machine is is huge and uh, one of the things that we can could do, because we're from Ministry of Digital Transformation, we obviously not a Ministry of Defense, so we can do our best to stop from economic standpoint any advances, any uh, money flow to to Russia, and this is how this all started. Can you walk me through the early hours of this? I mean, it was within 48 hours of the initial invasion that we saw your office come out with public letters to Apple CEO Tim Cook and other major American tech companies. 
What was that experience like for you as you were dealing with, as you just described, a, a surprising situation to so quickly move into gear like that? Well, I think that it's it's like instinct. If you want to survive, you have to act. You can't just lay down. Um, we had um, a number of connection with uh, big tech companies before the war. So it was not just uh, purely from scratch, just trying to reach out to them. We knew people and we realized that at, at first we need to start to block some tracking apps, some propaganda uh, websites, and uh, and also spread our war. Um, so at the beginning, we were just trying to uh, minimize the impact of uh, of their invasion. And... Uh, and then we quickly realized like it's it, it's it's just like every day was something brand new and we were working 24 seven. There was no, and still there's no weekend for us. Uh, we're just moving day after day after invasion started. And uh, uh, on the second day, we basically realized that we need to reach out to them to not just for, to help us uh, figure out specific tasks, um, and help with their help all militaries or help or uh, regular people because this was was also a task. Like I remember on the second day, it turned out that uh, they check Google always, uh, and they because they can see where there is a traffic jam on the on, on the digital map. I mean on Google Maps or uh, Waze or the other maps, and they can strike there. So we reached out to them. Ask them to just disable this functionality temporary, so and no one's going to see that. There's a other a number of other issues like with Google Maps, with their uh, with other communication services, and uh, uh, those ideas were also coming up from from uh, from our people because they were uh, also uh, um, like con con contacting us and telling uh, about different issues that they face. Uh, so so yeah. So this is this was really horrible, and, and still, it's it, it, it's now it sounds like more like a distant memory, but now I realize it's just forty days ago, um, because of so m much stuff happening every hour, and you uh, wake up every morning and you check your, and then you see it in the night. It was so many news about that, like bombing, shelling, rocketing, people dying. So. And and you have to adjust really quick. It's 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 not comparable with the peaceful times uh, when you you can make plans, you can do this long term, mid term, but during the war, it, it's it's really you know your goal, but uh, the way you're moving to this goal, you have to adjust every couple hours. What's motivating you to keep your focus on that goal and moving toward that goal right now? Well, uh, the, mo the mo major motivation is to stop the, those military actions because every day our people are dying, and it, it's it's very sad and it, it breaks my heart uh, because there are those are children, those are women, and uh, and many men, of course. Um, also, it's 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 really hard to observe like they destroying our country, our country infrastructure. And uh, um, during the last couple of years, Ukraine advanced a lot from infrastructure standpoint. There's uh, thousands of kilometers road built, new hospitals, new stadiums, and, and now it's being destroyed through the through entire country. So every time I see um, like a building, a residential or commercial building, like uh, roads that they completely destroyed with their tanks and um and enterprises that and businesses that were people were building for their entire life and then in in, in, in a moment is just gone it, it's it's a motivation to do whatever we can do to stop this right away and your office has been remarkably successful so far in exerting pressure on companies in recruiting an IT army, taking many different steps to address this conflict. And 
I wanted to ask you, you know, we've seen hundreds of companies now pull out from Russia because of a combination of the public pressure and, of course, sanctions. Are there any major companies that continue to be holdouts that you're still pressuring? Yeah, uh, well, to be fair, uh, almost all of them just said, yeah, we're moving out. But uh, unfortunately, some of them just made announcement but didn't really act. So, for example, um, IBM, Intel, um, SAP, and uh, uh, like Microsoft, companies like Microsoft, they still they still in a process. They, 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 so they announced, and what we see is not they're not really moving anywhere. Um, maybe it's just the first step. Maybe it's this company is too big, but um, this is the fact. Uh, some of them just maybe they pretend, maybe they're real. This maybe this is for real. But uh, what we see is that some of them not reacting really quickly. Are you talking to those companies and trying to get them to move faster? Yeah, yeah. Especially one, what what happened in Bucha? I'm not sure if you're familiar with this horrible massacre um, and. But again, to be fair, it's not just one place. It's 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 just one that is closer to Kiev. But there are other places where there's similar, um, with with the similar events. And when we'll, we'll coming back to the point, um, uh, when it happened to Bucha, we reached out again, say, saying like, listen, this is this is already out of hand, and it's 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 just unspeakable. Um, and uh, you can see now that if you continue this business with them, this is what they do with your money. With having your technologies, they supply their army with their equipment, with their money, again, with this taxpayer's money, and what this is what they do. And um, I think that that works. Because now people see for real what 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 do those animals are doing. And those events in Bucha have been heavily covered in American media. But I want to ask you, what is your office doing now in the second month of the war to use social media to keep the attention on what's happening in Ukraine? Well, of course, uh, all of our uh, social media is like, my my personal Twitter, Michael Fedor personal Twitter, all the social networks are, uh, of 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 the ministry. We we use them to spread this word. Also, there are, there are a number of activities on the media front that we um, are running, uh, especially to Russian citizens, because we still believe that they have to know the opposite point of view, because all they know is that uh, we kill ourselves like i'm literally it's literally what they're telling their people that we shot um our civilian people so our citizens our neighbors and this is this is again this is another issue of propaganda but what we're trying to do we we, we uh, make a lot of efforts on the media front to tell in russian with videos with proofs that uh, this is what really happened, and uh, and I know we reached millions of people in Russia with that. And that's really interesting that you're focusing on reaching people in Russia. Um, there is some concern that the approach of the digital blockade, calling on companies to pull out tech services in Russia, could have the consequence of leaving ordinary Russians disconnected from accurate news about the war. How do you weigh that trade-off and how do you think about that if you're using video and um, hoping to get in touch with people there? Well, we all have to remember this, that this is a totalitarian country and they do not tolerate the truth in any way. So um, we never asked um, like a big media company to leave completely and i mean uh, like leave them without information they blocked 
Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn themselves. This is their Roscomnadzor, what is called block. And, and I, I know that if uh, companies were spreading real news, uh, they were blocked. They will block them anyway. They would block them anyway. So there is no trade-off really. Uh, we we think that uh, once any media in Russia start telling the truth, it's it, it, they just get rid of it. So you, you so there is a matter of how you. Uh, value your reputation so if you're let's say search engine or you're popular so social platform and you don't want to block people opinions and minds your target for russians not for us it's not us they target those medias and how important is youtube now that so many other american social networks have been blocked in russia is that one of the key channels that you're using to get out your message there? Yeah, yeah, it's one of the key channels. Another channel, of course, is our, uh, our messengers, different messengers. Um, I don't want to name it because I'm sure they follow what we're talking about. And uh, but uh, we we can really reach out to people through through those messengers and YouTube. Um, and the reason they uh, didn't block YouTube yet. It's because they're using it, it for their own propaganda. And also, there are many and many people that are using for uh, YouTube for, um, I don't know, uh, earning money. So I think they're considering turning off YouTube. Uh, I heard rumors that's going to happen in a couple days from now. Um, but I think they're waging um, an effect of, uh, because they understand that if they close YouTube. It's on. Sorry. Want... Yeah. Oh, so sorry. I'm having some technical difficulties on my end. Sure. I'm so sorry. That. And yes, if you could just continue explaining how you're using YouTube, then I, I really apologize on my end. I just was having some issues with my camera. Sure, sure, no worries. So uh, as I mentioned before, using uh, YouTube to spread the word. And the reason they didn't block it is because they also use YouTube to spread their propaganda. And I think they're waging our consequences of turning off uh, YouTube completely. Um, because if they turn it off, they also won't be able to uh, tell their version of the story. So I think they're, they're, they will come up with some decision. And I heard rumors that in a couple of days from now, they're going to close it anyway. And I, I know that's the, that's, this is their decision. And I want to turn now to the role of cyber attacks, cyber attacks during this war. Um, can you tell me what destruction Russian cyber attacks have caused in Ukraine so far and how you're defending from them? Well, hopefully, and apparently not many as they expected. Um, I know that we experienced more than 3,000 attacks so far. So can you imagine this, uh, um, this volume? So they, they instantly attack in us. Um, I know over a couple of minor examples. Um, I'm, I'm not maybe uh, some of them probably might be classified, but uh, or just quickly fixed. But I don't know about any major incident uh, that they broke our digital infrastructure. I think that's the I think that the reason is because we were, were so prepared for that. And I'm I'm telling this not for the first time, but the war is, has started eight years ago, and they were attacking us instantly. Uh, throughout all these years, and uh, we we figured out how to defend ourselves, but the scale and uh, the pressure, of course, after February twenty fourth, is it's much much more. But anyway, uh, we are safe and we are restoring 
uh, our digital uh, services and, and launching more and more, even in, in the times of war. And I wanted to ask you too, you have raised millions of dollars for Ukraine through cryptocurrencies. What is the advantage of raising during uh, raising through cryptocurrencies versus traditional currencies? And how have you used those funds? Sure. Uh, well, the advantage is that it's it's much, much quicker. And it's it's really like international. So and it's easy to people in easier to people for to donate. Because, uh, like, if you're in Ukraine, there are. Uh, by the way, there are a number of funds that exist uh, along with with our funds in in fiat currencies in in, in regular form. But uh, if you're somewhere far away from Ukraine, and you, you take their account number, uh, Swift message uh, to to start transfer, then it takes days. But if you have a crypto, you can just uh, go to your mobile app, send crypto, and in five, five minutes, it's on account. Also, I think it's a matter of transparency because people see, um, you know, because of the blockchain technology, they're able to see uh, where these funds go and uh, how much people are donating in total and how this is being spent. Not exactly, I mean, where money goes specifically for which per purchase, but they can see generally that money are going uh, or spending and they're able to track uh, th this um, at least partially. Um, so the reason we opened this fund because we uh, we were under uh, heavy lim limitation uh, during the first day of war, especially from National Bank of Ukraine. So it was really hard to get money uh, out of Ukraine, especially uh, uh, foreign currencies, euro and a dollar. So establishing this fund together with the uh, Kuna, which is private exchange, um, allowed, uh, allowed us to quickly disperse this money and make critical purchases in days, not in weeks. Because if you uh, send crypto transaction in five minutes, it's there. But if you send wire transfer, it could take three days. So, so that's the advantage. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today, and we'll have to leave it there. Alex Bornyakov, thank you for joining us here on Washington Post Live. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining us here today. I'm Kat Sakreski. To check out what interviews we have coming up, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and find more information about all of our upcoming pro programs.